Good evening, everyone. My name is Dave Dulio, and I am the director of the Center for Civic Engagement at Oakland University. Thank you for being here for our virtual town hall on understanding the politics of Macomb County in presidential elections, featuring Dr. Stan Greenberg. The Center for Civic Engagement prides itself on being a convener of conversations about issues of public importance. During presidential elections, Macomb County is definitely important. Macomb County is a special place in Michigan and plays a critical role in Michigan politics. Macomb is also a place that is very important to Oakland University. And now that we're in the home stretch of the 2020 election cycle, we thought that Macomb County and its politics deserved some specific attention. And who better to provide that attention than Dr. Stan Greenberg, the person who coined the famous term in American politics, the Reagan Democrats. I'd like to recognize a few people who are in our virtual audience this evening. Macomb County Executive Mark Hackle and several members of his team are here. Welcome. The Mayor of Warren, Mayor Fouts is here. Welcome, sir. Oakland University President Dr. Ora Hirsch Peskovitz and several members of her cabinet are in attendance. And Macomb, Macomb Community College President Jim Sawyer and MCC board members Kathy Lorenzo, Joan Flynn, and Libby, Libby Argiri are here. Thank you. Before I introduce Dr. Greenberg, I'd like to first thank our sponsors. This event would not be possible without their support. Our presenting sponsor is the Macomb County Chamber of Commerce. Our VIP sponsor is Oakland University in Macomb. And our supporting sponsors are Leadership Macomb and First State Bank. And I'd like to invite Jeremiah Honer, the chairman of the board of the Macomb County Chamber to say a few words. Hi, good evening and thank you, Dave. Uh, my name is Jeremiah Hainer, and I have the privilege and honor of serving as the chairman of the board this year for the Macomb County Chamber of Commerce. Our chamber is very excited to sponsor tonight's event. Our mission statement has been and will continue to be greater voice, greater connections, and greater value. These three core principles are evident in and at the forefront of all we do. The Macomb County Chamber in its 128th year is a growing organization of over a thousand members and businesses. The Chamber provides greater value to our members through networking opportunities, business and professional development, and leadership development. We are embracing technology to engage and inspire our members. We also provide our members an opportunity to engage their local and state leaders on a variety of public policy issues. We provide opportunities to make important connections, greater connections, between our members and their elected leaders, to develop strategic relationships, and to develop partnerships that can create positive change in our communities. Our chamber is proud of our focus on public policy. We believe that this is a critical component of civic engagement and why we are excited to sponsor tonight's event. The chamber utilizes its public policy committee, a committee of member volunteers from a variety of businesses and perspectives to analyze and review emerging public policy issues, all with the focus of making sure our members' needs, concerns, and interests are being served. Our commitment to and embrace of public policy has given our members a greater voice. Please visit our website, macombcountychamber.com, to learn more about us. And again, thank, thank you so much for this opportunity. The Macomb County Chamber is honored and privileged to sponsor tonight's event. Thank you, Jeremiah. We really appreciate it. And now I'd like to ask Julie Dichtel, Executive Director of OU's Macomb County Outreach, to say a few words. I thought we had Julie. Technical difficulties are no new, uh, new feature to Zoom. Uh, so again, thank you to all our sponsors. Um, I, I'm getting, I, Julie here, one second for Julie. We just need to get her unmuted. There we go. Still unmute, Julie. Still muted. How are we now? Good evening and welcome. My name is Julie Dictal. I'm the Executive Director for Oakland University's Macomb County Outreach. We're proud to be the sponsor of this virtual town hall this evening. 
You know, Macomb County has been integral to OU success since our founding more than 60 years ago. In fact, OU is the school of choice for undergraduate students in Macomb County. And about one third of our student population and more than 25,000 Oakland University alums call Macomb County their home. Throughout the years, Oakland University has been committed to expanding access to higher education in Macomb County, one of the largest in the nation without a four-year university within its borders. In 1991, we strengthened that commitment by joining Macomb Community College as one of the first three original partners in the newly established Macomb University Center in Clinton Township. Today, we're the largest of the now 11 partners and uh, we continue to enjoy a very strong relationship with Macomb Community College. In 2011, OU expanded its presence in the county and expanded its degree offerings when it opened the doors to the OU Anton Frankel Center in downtown Mount Clemens. Between the two locations, OU offers 14 different degree programs that enroll about 2,000 students annually. But OU's commitment to Macomb County extends well beyond the classroom. Our students, faculty, staff, and alumni actively participate and engage in local community events. We stay connected through strong relationships with our local leaders, resulting in opportunities for internships and economic development initiatives. And through the local chambers and organizations like Leadership Macomb, we network and communicate so that we can stay informed and visible. In short, OU is proud of its commitment to Macomb County. We value our relationship with our local leaders and we strive to make a difference in the lives of the county residents. Thank you again for letting us be a part of this opportunity tonight. So thanks go to you, Julie, and thanks for all your work on behalf of OU in Macomb County. One final note to our audience before we begin, uh, feel free to ask questions as the session progresses either through the chat function or the Q&A function in Zoom. Both of these are at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will get to those after Dr. Greensburg, Greenberg's presentation. I will um, ask questions uh, toward the end of the session. And uh, now to introduce Dr. Greenberg, uh, Stanley Greenberg is a New York Times best-selling author and polling advisor to presidents, prime ministers, and CEOs across the globe. He received his bachelor's degree from Miami University and his PhD from Harvard University. He was the senior pollster for President Bill Clinton and Vice President Al Gore, British Prime Minister Tony Blair, and President Nelson Mandela in South Africa. Greenberg's corporate clients include Boeing, BP, Microsoft, and other global companies. Greenberg's research and writing on disruptive changes in the US, Britain, Europe, South Africa, and Venezuela, and in the parties of both left and right is driving the public debate. His book about how America addresses, addresses its deapest problems was ap applauded by Walter Isaacson, author of Steve Jobs, for its quote, great sense of history, as well as deep understanding of the hopes and fears of today's Americans. And as I mentioned, Dr. Greenberg coined the term Reagan Democrats, after in-depth study of Macomb County in the 1980s. You can read re this research in his book, Middle Class Dreams, which was published by Yale University Press. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Greenberg. Thank you, sir, for being here with us tonight. Um, thank you, David. Thank you, Dr. Drulia. Um, thank you, uh, Oakland University and also Macomb Chamber uh, for hosting uh, this speech. I insist we carry on despite the pandemic. It's quite a commitment with three weeks to go to an in a historic election. And from my point of view, Macomb is the best window we have into America and its trends. And thank you for getting me to focus on it uh, today. But I'm not going to talk uh, about the graphs for a while. So I'm happy to be uh, um, for people to actually hear my, see my face and lips and, uh, and get a sense of what I'm, uh, of what I'm saying. Um, for me, Macomb uh, is the crosshairs of so many trends uh, since World War II, the upheavals in the 60s, civil rights, affirmative action, uh, race, immigration, globalization, trade, and NAFTA, the state of unions. In, in every instant, it provided the ground troops uh, for the working class revolt against the elites. 
Uh, Macomb was white, ethnic Catholic, a union community that voted heavily for Kennedy, Johnson, and Humphrey, but revolted to vote for Wallace, then Nixon against McGovern, and most dramatically, indeed by, indeed by two to one margin for Ronald Reagan and Walter Mondale. That's when, that's when, that's when I began uh, listening to Macomb's citizens. Uh, it's why the question was, why did they revolt? Why, you know, what will it take for them to listen to Democrats? And, and is there anything Democrats can say that is compatible with being a multiracial party in favor of civil rights, a party of the cities and rural, rural areas as well? My first campaign uh, was as pollster, um, you know, outside of Connecticut, was while teaching at Yale, was to help Bob Carr get reelected to Congress in 1982. A lot of good friends uh, from that period I still have. You know, I worked closely uh, with the MEA and UAW, uh, and they asked me to do these focus groups in Macomb, you know, to answer, you know, these questions. Now, in those, day, in those days, we did not have focus group facilities, and I conducted, you know, most of them, you know, in bars and, and, and restaurants. Uh, it's my philosophy in doing focus groups. The key to a focus group is listening, and respecting the people who you, who you are researching, never questioning why they express, the, express such over-the-top views. Indeed, accept that they may have very good reasons for it. That means never mix groups by race, gender, class, or political point of view. And that was like the innovation that I introduced starting in Macomb County. So I remember to this day, the group that was white men, UAW members, who voted for Reagan, they felt they could speak freely and when presented with a quote from Robert Kennedy about the need to redress racial imbalances, one guy jumped at me and said, no wonder they shot him. No wonder they shot him. Now, as an academic, I just finished a book uh, where I conducted one-on-one -on -one in-depth interviews uh, in Alabama, South Africa, Israel, and, and Northern Ireland. I interviewed trade union leaders, business executives, the heads of farm organizations. Uh, but South Africa had the biggest impact on my thinking because they were justifying the use of apartheid, the most deeply offensive system of racial domination, <clears throat> to justify why they used the labor laws or the migrant labor system to advance the interests of their members. So that was the social science methodology in my head when I believe made it possible, possible for me to listen and respect people who felt they had been betrayed. Now, the Macomb people that I spoke with, they were part of the white working class revolt against an America that was coming to terms with its racial past and making racial equality a reality. But look at what happened to them as they moved to the suburbs to realize the middle class dreams and home ownership. You know, they were prom home, home ownership they were promised. Millions of blacks uh, migrated out of the South during World War II and continued as afterwards as the sharecropping economy crashed and industry grew. <clears throat> Democrats rightly pushed for desegregation of the schools and neighborhoods, and that brew produced the riots busing and political upheaval. But don't forget, America was deindustrializing, facing foreign competition for cars with Reagan, with Reagan, and attacks on the power of the union, big tax cuts for the richest and CEOs, uh, with the Bush and Clinton passage of NAFTA, and accelerating globalization costing even more jobs. So the elites just underestimate how much pressure the, the elites, the academics, the business community, economists, metropolitan leaders who embrace globalization, actually don't second guess globalization, just overestimate how many Americans um, have graduated from college with four years degrees. It's part of them not seeing working Americans and what it is feeling. <clears throat> that is a big part of why the polls underestimated Donald Trump in 2016 which, uh, who was benefiting from the white working class revolt. So when I wrote my report on Reagan Democrats, I emphasized these voters 
felt betrayed by Democrats. They had acted responsibly, worked hard, were personally responsible, but why aren't you listening? But two pieces were critical to my thinking going forward. They were angry that the corporations had such a big say in politics and thought Reagan was governing for them. The other was how much they were looking for, for government to do something about healthcare. And for me, that was what tried to get Democrats to focus on. You know, I called them Reagan Democrats because they weren't, they weren't fans of Reagan and they did not become Republicans. You know, they on really fundamental things, they were ready to listen to Democrats if they could come to terms with the issues that they were facing. So I was asked to go to Washington to, to present the findings to a to huge group of uh, mucky mucks at the Democratic National Committee in 1985. Afterwards, the chair ostracized me and urged that no groups work with me. It was at a time when Jesse Jackson was running for president, and I was saying we should continue to reach out to these voters, even if they were obviously racist. They were working people with working class values. Many of them were racist had lived through that history. And I was saying, we cannot not listen to them. I'm not for appealing, I'm very explicitly not appealing to them on those terms, but recognizing they were upset about corporate power, upset what was happening with outsourcing of jobs, upset about healthcare costs and, and nobody uh, addressing it. So in Michigan, um, it was not an option to write off those voters. And ultimately I polled for Congressman David Bonnier who believed in people, their humanity, the appeal of progressive values, and the necessity of addressing the environment and climate change, among others. I began working with the Democratic Leadership Council and ultimately with Governor Bill Clinton, who was demonstrably able to win in the South by winning back both black and white voters. You can't, there's no formula for success unless you can win for Democrats, unless you can win with both white and black voters. He did it with a strong populist appeal against the oligarchs in, uh, in Arkansas and a strong focus on education and hard work. Yeah. And he turned to me to deal with the other part of the Democrats' problem, losing the defection of white ethnic voters in the suburbs and how you unite black and white in places like Detroit you know, and Macomb. It's important to understand this story. This is a story not about appealing to Macomb alone, and Macomb will evolve over time. It's how do you deal with Macomb when you are committed to a country of advancing the needs and interests of both black and white? So I have the three by five card that uh, Clinton handed to me after he gave the speech at Macomb County Community College <clears throat> about his vision for the country. He was determined to give the same speech there and, and at a black church in Detroit during the primary to show that he had a very different formula than other leaders. It was a race class narrative saying the bosses are using race to divide you. So it's about time you got together, got together to unite around your common interest. Clinton won Macomb in the primary and, and critically, uh, you know, cut Rep the Republican margin to five points um, in, the, in, the, in 1992, and he won decisively in 1996. But Democrats, after his win, had their biggest challenge because this country was changing. It was, it was getting growing support with an emerging diverse coalition of the rising American electorate, uh, and, and the challenge was winning with that diverse coalition, more immigrant uh, population, at the same time that it was trying to win with white working class voters. So in 2008, the Democrats nominated um, the, an African-American nominee to be president. What would be more revealing about the state of the country and where better to re-examine those, the state of the country than in McCall? Uh, and we can now, uh, you know, open my graphs. Go to the next slide. Um, here you can just, just remembering for the country, I actually put this, I put this deck, I put this slide in decks I present all the time, 
to show how much Macomb County controls the future. If you want to know where the country is, look at what's happened uh, to Democrats in, in Macomb. That will tell you their future. Uh, and you can see what happened with Obama winning uh, in his two elections, um, but then Trump uh, you know, winning uh, you know, before we have a, a very different election uh, now. Go to the next slide. So I conducted in the summer of 2008, before the Democratic Convention, I conducted a survey in, uh, in Macomb and Oakland uh, you know, and, uh, and statewide um, to, to look at the election. And I just you know, want to start with just asking people what is the biggest economic concern and outsourcing of jobs was number one. So you just lose track of you know, the thread uh, from what I showed with Reagan De Democrats, Macomb County you know, in 1985 and 86, what was happening uh, when they were thinking about whether to uh, vote for Obama. Go to the next slide. Uh, we looked. We looked at the reasons to support Obama, and they could have. They could give many answers to that question. But you see, at the top is he, he's for the middle class and tax cuts for, uh, for the middle class. And it'll end outsourcing of jobs, uh, and it'll deal with affordable health care. He's dealing with the Iraq War, but just notice the common theme: the middle class, outsourcing of jobs, health care, just runs through um, for Macomb and actually for the country that these two issues had to be addressed if they were going to be voting uh, for Democrats and be voting for Obama. Next slide. You know, we asked whether, you know, we asked whether Obama was more like, who, which leader he was more like. And what you see is that it was very much to be seen like John F. Kennedy and not Jesse Jackson. Because in the focus groups, go to the next slide. In the focus groups, you know, you, I have this long response here. You saw these very reasonable discussions of people who you think would never think to vote for a black candidate, a black president, uh, in this mostly heavily white community. And they are really double checking. And the big issue is, is he gonna be for his own people or is he gonna govern for the whole country? And it's really a very thoughtful discussion of you know, whether he was going to govern for the whole country. And that's why the, you know, John F. Kennedy, not Jesse Jackson, was so important in their thinking. Go to the next slide. You know, we asked a question coming out of the focus groups, you know, whether, what's the biggest problem here? The middle class today is more threatened by global trade CEOs and uh, who care more about their companies than their own country and politicians who are supporting the trade agreements backed by corporate special interests, or the middle class today is more threatened by affirmative action by minorities who don't take responsibility for their own lives and by illegal immigration getting free government benefits. And, and what you see is at the time in July, we, you know, it was 17 points in favor that it, the middle class is the bigger challenge, it grew to 21 at the, at the time of the election. Uh, but you know, just think about you know, what would, what would have happened had I asked this question in 1985? Um, how were I doing polls? Because there's no question then Detroit, the threat of blacks, what was happening, the violent, violence was seen to be a huge threat to their whole life. What we're finding is that no, what they want to know is are the leaders going to address this imbalance um, with the middle class struggling and CEOs? Global trade, CEOs not fighting for their own companies. Go to the next one. Yeah, and, here, and here you can see the numbers of people who say whether will he, will Obama put the interests of black Americans first or the country first? Um, at the time we, we did this research, it started at 60% said the country. A third said he thought, you know, his own groups. Um, by the time we got to the election, two thirds of those in Macomb thought he would be putting the interests of the country first, which for Macomb is a, is a huge step forward given the entire history with Reagan Democrats as part of why Obama carried it twice. Go to the next. Okay, I'm gonna go back to speaking and I'll come back to the slides um, you know, in a minute, okay? So I conducted the focus groups in Macomb you know, before the Democrat convention, they just saw the, uh, the numbers. 
it was a primary where, you know, Reverend Wright sermons were center stage. It was pretty daunting to think that this potential black president uh, would win them. Uh, it could not have been more revealing, you know, if you listen to people, if you respect them. Um, they weren't worried about Detroit, which they did when I, you know, first did this research in, uh, in the mid 80s. That history didn't come up, which had been the greatest threat to their future. They were trying to figure out whether he'd govern for the whole, you know, country um, and whether he would address health care. So this was in the middle of the financial crisis, but they reflect a revolt of working people angry about their job being exported and tired of being killed by health care costs, which we have always found at each point. So let me look now at what they, at what they, what they say once we get to the election of Obama. And we'll go back to the graphs. And again, I want you to listen and respect how they are coming to a judgment, uh, you know, a judgments. Bring back the, uh, okay. Um, you know, and I'm going to leave this up, but I'm going to, I'm going to present the, uh, I probably have it out of sequence, uh, but I'm going to talk about the graphs. What happened after, you know, after Obama's uh, election, uh, we had, we had people that uh, felt that they were, that they were, uh, that they were not listening and respecting and how they were coming to their judgment. They were, the race was part of the problem about this black president, but they were desperate for a leader, brave enough to uh, oppose outsourcing. And they wanted a trade regime that, that kept blocking their chance for jobs. And again, they were looking for big changes in, uh, in uh, health care. The financial crisis, in the, uh, in the end, they were bitterly disappointed by Obama's presidency. Uh, they played the biggest possible role in electing Donald Trump um, in 2016. Um, and, the, uh, and they obviously delivered the state of Michigan uh, to Trump but it was symptomatic of the revolt against the elites after the financial crisis and the revolt against the Affordable Care Act. Now, let me start uh, with these groups. So they watched the financial crisis and the bailout of Wall Street and banks with great anger. Uh, we, we, know, you know, we, we know in Macomb how much they were looking for corporate elites uh, to be held accountable. By the way, I think these, let me go through the sides a second. Yeah. All right, let's, let's go to the beginning of this. I'm not, I'll just present this uh, without the, uh, the graphs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're dealing with Macomb. After the election of Obama, they decided he would work for the whole country. But they watched the financial crisis and the bailout of Wall Street with great anger. And we know in Macomb how much they were looking for corporate elites to be held account and bail out those responsible for the crisis uh, was just unimaginable. They were so angry that the bank, you know, the bank senior management and CEOs got their bonuses and nobody went to jail. You know, it was not in Obama's style, um, you know, to take them on. He was more concerned with the financial well-being of the banking sector, which may have been good policy. There was no relief for homeowners uh, who were foreclosed. America's wages and uh, median income crashed. Many lost all their wealth and they did not get back to pre-financial crisis level income until Obama's last year. They seethed, but the metropolitan elites in Obama only saw a macro economy that added jobs every year. In my focus groups, they, they would attack the moderator when I would present President Obama talking about how many jobs had been created. The Affordable Care Act was historic, you know, but not popular with working Americans who found it expensive with high deductibles. That means you couldn't afford to use it and you paid a tax penalty if uninsured. Medicaid expansion was popular, but not the market that many depended on. And as you know, they were looking for decades in Macomb, uh, you know, for help uh, with healthcare, but it was unaffordable, you know, and maddening. Obama's job approval crashed with the white working class. And I came to Macomb in 2017 after Trump's election in 2018 to see whether they would, you know, whether they would break with him. They were, proud, they were proud of their vote. So let's go to the next round. They were proud of their vote, resented the idea that they should regret it, 
but at the same time, their families were deeply divided. Now, the focus groups I conducted was a great challenge because the, the country was so divided. So how did I get these white, white working class voters to speak uh, freely? Um, we made sure we had, first of all, at the outset, we, we mixed Clinton voters and Trump voters and discovered we could never do that again. Mm -hmm. And Trump voters had to know that everybody there was a Trump voter. Uh, it was only white men or women, you know, and uh, uh, in some cases, they learned that uh, that they were all Trump voters. Um, they all and they all shared their stories of how liberated they felt because they were under siege and at home in the country. And there was we provided no political material in uh, in this group in order not to you know dissuade them from talking about their Trump vote. We all had a lot of discussion of moral sentiment again to make them comfortable speaking about their their vote for Trump. Go to the next slide. What we found was they were just, there was this crushing divide taking place in their families. You know, because the Trump vote was generational, overwhelmingly generational, it was also class, but it was overwhelmingly generational. So millennials had voted, had not voted for Trump at all. Um, and the older you got, you had the strongest uh, Trump voters. But that meant that families had to constantly deal with the fact that they're, uh, we're fighting, you know, over Trump. I lost contact with my own daughter because of the election. You know, my girlfriend's little brother's 10 years old. Right away, he's saying, screw Trump. A lot of young girls, I call them young, they're in their 20s. You know, the, the 20s, I see them as Democrats. They, they began to see millennials as Democrats. They don't support the president uh, bringing change, so they're launching... They're latching on to everything in the fake news about what he's done, what he said, uh, you know, what he's ruined, you know, that's what Obama did. And so they were, you have this playing out with the civil war, you know, within the family. Next slide. And what we began to see was much more discussion of race. Uh, this is in 2017, this changes as we get to 18, but at the beginning after Trump was elected, um, you have, you know, if you're a white minority, you have to, you've checked the wrong box. A lot of talk about immigrants, much more than black white issues, uh, much less discussion of African Americans in Detroit. Uh, Barack Obama still didn't govern for, for his own group. They still respected him. But we played the uh, Coca-Cola ad, you know, that sings America the Beautiful in Eight Languages as kind of a test of multiculturalism, how they're dealing with multiculturalism, and about half kind of accepted it. Go to the next one. Uh, if you go to the second half of that, you know, the half of them kind of responded in the, with a different tone after, you know, watching the, the ad. You know, I didn't get upset about that. I mean, that's what makes America great, to be honest with you. That's the way America should be. Multicultural is a good thing. It really is. You know, I'm trying to show us unity, like we can come together and get along and enjoy a Coke. And so about half the groups in Macomb, these groups, you know, responded positively to a kind of a multicultural, you know, identity. Uh, the, um, and so the, but they were, you know, they were, next slide. They were also very upset about, you know, Obamacare. And it became very clear at a time when uh, the Republicans and, and Trump were trying to repeal it, that it was a consuming issue for all the groups. You, because you've heard this lecture, You've heard me begin with what happened in, uh, in Macomb in 1985, that there's so much commonality to the problems that they want government to address. It was a consuming issue. They were focused on cost and affordability. And they, you just don't underestimate people you know, to, a, to a penny, you know, what it cost, uh, how much was being deducted, what were the deductibles. And the deductibles were everything as well as there being exchanges that have, that have cost outrageous and affordability, as well as that, you know, having to pay a tax, go to the next slide. Uh, and, you, and you see this like deep struggles with you know, the Affordable Care Act. Um, they cut my insurance at work, my doctors, my back is bad, says, well, well cut your hours. You can only work so many hours now to have to work more hours. 
take more pain pills. You get my insurance back and now they're telling me I can't get it back another year. Just consume with the interaction of the requirements under the Affordable Care Act and just how expensive it was. Let's go to the next slide. You see what happened um, you know, to Obama's approval ratings. Uh, and if you look at the Rust Belt states uh, and the states that, you know, that Hillary struggled in in 2008. And if you look in 2009, you can see the approval rating, you know, in, you know, in those states of 2009. And then what happens, you know, in 2010 in the lead up to the off-year elections, you know, you had the, the, you had the bailout of the banks and the inability to, you know, to, for anybody to pay a price uh, for what happened uh, with Wall Street. You watch the introduction of the Affordable Care Act, you know, and all the anger they have on, you know, on how this was operating for them. Uh, and what you see is the approval rating for Obama dropping 10 points in Florida, uh, Iowa, Maine, Michigan, I think one of the biggest, Minnesota, New Hampshire, North Carolina, Ohio, you know, you know, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Uh, you don't, there was no honeymoon for Obama, but it was, it was, it was, it was the bailout tarp, nobody paying a price with the banks, at the same time that the Affordable Care Act was being introduced, um, that they, that they, you know, that they were struggling with and were, and were hoping that the Republicans uh, would, would address. Uh, so it's a, it's a pa enormously painful time in uh, in the country and in uh, in Macomb, um, and the and support for Trump has a strong racial sentiment, but it has evolved into whether uh, you know, whether you are dealing with these issues raised by Obama. But it also has to do with the fact of a multicultural America. Barack Obama was a black president uh, in a country that's multicultural. And multi, they know multiculturalism is ascendant, at least half of them do, uh, because a lot of their kids are from interracial marriages. You know, that's inevitable when 17% of new marriages, you know, are interracial. So the most important they think they wanted from Trump was affordable health care, a president who would stand up to, to the CEOs that were moving pr production to Mexico, and one who would fight uh, NAFTA and the trade agreements. And finally, that you know, they had reasons to be for Trump. You know, it was not because of racial resentment; it was more because uh, of these mix of other issues. And they aren't fools. You know, they watched Trump, and Trump lost them. You know, they aren't fools. They watched how Trump tried to repeal the ACA, and offered no plan in its place. They saw he did nothing about pharma and the big drug co drug companies. They watched him try to cut. Medicaid and Medicare, and his assault on Obamacare that was driving up prices for them. They saw the corporate tax cut for exactly what it was, a massive tax cut for the top 1% and, and his rich buddies. Uh, and of course, nothing really changed on trade and they were even un, uncertain you know, about the tariffs that he had brought in. And so they turned against him uh, in 2018, going into 2018. Uh, and they would play a big part in the Democratic wave, you know, particularly the Democratic House gains in the Rust Belt. But let's use that fact, you know, to talk about their invisibility. Let's step back. 2018 was a huge wave, gave Democrats control of the House. Who do you think was responsible? Who contributed most to the gains in 2018? Was it the suburbs? Was it the women college graduates? Or, or was it the white working class on rural areas of the country? Of course you think the suburbs, uh, and, th and they were close over time and so those flipped. But in fact, the shift amongst white working class women and men was 13 points in favor of the Democrats to the margins that Trump had against Hillary um, nationally. And also, uh, you know, also in Michigan, it was four times the gains, the margin gained for Democrats was four times bigger 
with white working class voters than it was in the suburbs. But they're invisible. They, to be honest, the elites didn't believe that the white working class was pulling back from Trump. Um, and they have not brought that into their analysis. Um, so, you know, Whitmer and Democratic House candidates had a, had a big day that would reverse what happened in 16. Uh, it, was a, it was a well-considered vote. They knew where they were voting against Trump, who disappointed them. Let me go to 2020 and the, uh, what's happening now in this election. Uh, uh, you don't need to hear from me to know that Joe Biden enjoys a near you know, double-digit lead in the presidential contest and leads by a wide margin in Michigan. President Trump's defeat has been building since he was first elected. No trend has reversed course and every trend has accelerated. As a result, Democrats uh, won in the midterm by a 9.6% margin and they look like they are having the same kind of lead as we speak now. Uh, even re and remarkable turnout could even drive that further. You know, as Biden locked up the nomination, I wanted to listen to white work because voters in rural areas and blue collar suburbs in Ohio and Michigan. Uh, some were from Macomb uh, with Zoom focus groups and don't have to be now physically uh, present uh, there. So I can do groups that I mentioned earlier in uh, Oakland at, uh, and Macomb. And there are two things to note in those groups. These were all swing voters who had voted for Trump. These weren't core, you know, base Republicans. We would play his rallies, you know, uh, in, the, in the focus groups, and they watched, and they watched the body language. They were less likely to vote for Trump after watching his rallies, both men and women. And the reason was they were, they thought he was divisive. And when I talked to the women, they said, I think he's for the forgotten men. And he's so divisive, he can't really bring change. And he just failed on health, uh, health costs, which is everything. You know, in the groups, just throw out the word healthcare and they go to their own horror stories. $16,000 deductible, employers throwing them off health insurance, ridiculous premiums, $400 bill for their asthma medicine pay, you know, paid out of you know, pocket. Mm. Now, let's go to the graphs or may or may not be in the right place. <laughs> Nope, that's, that's at the end of this. That's in my last section. So we'll, we'll, I'll continue to speak. So the, the poll filings I've been watching, most of all have you know, Biden uh, you know, winning with white working class. Sorry, Biden making, doing very well with white working class. But his base, you know, Trump is doing disastrously with all white college educated voters, both men and women. He is losing with white voters over 65, including in Florida. He's losing in a landslide with millennials, uh, as well as black and Hispanic and unmarried women. You know. But the key is uh, the white work, work, working class. And what right now, Biden is getting 43% of the women. They are a majority of the white working class. There is no way. Sometimes you hmm. walk like yeah. I'm not taking my, my, uh, my daughter. <laughs> um, and so they, there's, there's no way he can get a revolt with the white working class because the women who are majority of the working class are done with them. You know, he lost, he won them by 27 points in 2016. Uh, but right now that margin for him is about eight or 10 points in the battleground state. And there's, there's no way there can be such a revolt. And we've watched the white working class men move somewhat back to, you know, toward Biden, but well short of what Trump had in, in 2016. You know, he's going to these states, he's going to these rallies, but I've watched these voters watch the rallies. They're divisive, they don't give hope, there's no sense of change. He's just playing a card that is, you know, is not you know, working. Um, and so, they, they are going to, the, the white working class is going to play a critical role for him. And I think it'll play out most of all in his big, fun, big finding positioning here in Michigan um, and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, but also doing well in North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, and Arizona. And that's being produced by the white working class, not the other trends. 
So women are the most important piece of this uh, because they are the majority of the working class, um, but they cannot deliver the final blow as in 2016, you know. And so I, you know, I assume President Trump will give up office and Democrats will unite around an agenda, uh, big economic relief, expand the public option for healthcare, you know, major infrastructure, public investment for climate change, voting rights, criminal justice, you know, and more and more and more. But we're in a country that is still divided. And let me talk, let me talk about each party, because I think it's gonna, even though I believe Biden is gonna win and Trump is going to be repudiated, I also think we're going to enter a period, a short-term period, where we're going to address the economic crisis. We're in health and economic crisis. Democrats have an agenda that they can pass if they have full control, which I think they will. But then that misses what's happening in the country. The first is within the Democratic Party. It was a struggle to unite behind Biden. Uh, took two steps in the process for us, for Democrats to get united in our data. First, it was Sanders and the convention uh, that uh, consolidated his voters, but it took the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Ginsburg for the other primary candidates, including those who supported Bloomberg and Buttigieg, you know, to come to Biden. And so Democrats are fairly reluctant and you have this uh, equally divided between liberals on the one hand and moderates and conservatives. Trends like different trends uh, in the party, millennials producing more liberal Democrats, uh, but ex-Republicans uh, and the suburbs producing more moderate. And if you look at the Democratic House right now, the new Democratic caucus is bigger than the Progressive Caucus. So that's, that is a fight that is put off uh, because of dealing with defeating Trump and dealing with the short-term agenda. But the Democratic Party is, is not united, you know, by any means. But that is all very civil compared to the uh, Republicans. Uh, where, you know, where you have Trump having a base uh, with Tea Party, evangelical and observant Catholics. It's about 70% of, you know, of the Republicans. And in fact, if you, if you look at this country right now, 42%, 44% approve of Trump, 54% disapprove, but 44% approve. So think of that. After everything we've been through, uh, with 215,000 deaths, the handling of the coronavirus, um, the, the, the mess at Walter Reed and his own, you know, you know, you know how he's you know, handled it at the White, ha White House, uh, he's going back onto the campaign trail, everything that's happened, there's still 44% who approve of Trump, the job he's doing. Because Republicans have, have a base that is, you know, it is regionally concentrated uh, in the South and Appalachian Valley, uh, in more rural, old, you know, older parts of the country, more uh, where evangelicals play a bigger role. And if you bring up the slides, a second. Hmm. Uh, and if you look, for example, at the Affordable Care Act, you know, this is this is a slide where uh, this is last year, where I looked at the people who strongly approve of Trump and approve of Trump. On the Affordable Care Act, the strong approve, by the way, they are seventy percent of of the of the strong approve. So overwhelmingly, Republicans, those who are with Trump, are strongly with him. So they will dominate the future of the Republican Party. And if you look here at the Affordable Care Act. 81% have a very cool, very negative, you know, view of it. The rest of the country has three quarters have a positive view of it, you know, but those who are strong approve of Trump, you know, incredibly negatively, intensely negative. Go to the next slide. Here we ask about uh, your view of whether, about the race narrative in the country and whether African-Americans are discriminated against uh, or whether they, it's their own fault. If we look at the state of the country and think about this, we are, have come out of the pandemic 
with a new, a new con a very a very broad consciousness in the country. Look at the the numbers that were in the street for Black Lives Matter protests, and much bigger than you know anything on the opposition side. But on this question of whether this is a country uh, where discrimination played a big role, or or, or whether people whether their condition is their own fault, if I look at the strong approve, sixty three percent strongly believe it's their own fault. And you just take the total approve, which is the 44% of the country, you got a three quarters who, you know, who say it's their fault. The intense is at 58%. Now, if you go to people who disapprove, who are a big majority of the country, 64% say it's discrimination. So I want to leave you with that slide because it tells you about the state of the Republican Party and the challenges that those, the Never Trumpers and others who want to change the Republican Party so it can bring change, uh, but it also tells you about as the, uh, a new administration comes to power, um, and you can, you can go past this, as a new administration comes to power, the, uh, you know, it has to deal with a country that has divisions within the two parties that are just under the surface and actually a pretty fundamental group of people who are challenging, which is put me, may have played out in Michigan, a fairly large group of people who strongly believe um, that the, the direction of the country is, is not where they want to go. Um, but I want to assure you, it is through Macomb County that I have you know, developed that perspective. And, uh, and thank you for allowing me to spend the time here learning from your people. And, and also advising leaders uh, who I believe have become better leaders, better people, and a better country uh, for the values uh, that you and the issues that you raise here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Greenberg. We really appreciate your thoughts and, and uh, the presentation. Uh, we are at the bottom of the hour, but we've got lots of questions, uh, as you can imagine, um, that have come through. And to, to kick them off, um, We've got two polling questions for you. We've got some folks that are uh, deep in the weeds of polling, it seems. Um, and the first one, uh, how does the most recent Gallup poll that shows 59% of Americans saying they are better off today, even with COVID, than they were four years ago, play into the upcoming election? Um, I, don't, I don't believe that. <laughs> I don't believe that. The, uh, look, what I believe uh, is the question which on whether you think the country is on the wrong, on the wrong track. And I think we're over three quarters, near 80%. We say we're on the wrong track. You know, and that is you know, what's correlated uh, with you know, people voting uh, for change. Uh, but, but I do want to get at the question about, about the economy and, and about, and about the, the fact that the president gets good marks on the economy even though that does not appear to be correlated so much with his vote. Because I do think, you know, he touched something that Macomb voters have been asking for. He didn't deliver, they failed him. And it's part of why they turned against him in the midterms. And I believe we'll turn against them in, in the election three weeks from now. Is that he was saying outsourcing is, a, is bad, that the Having supply chains in which American jobs are moving out of country is not is not good. I'll put pressure on companies. I'll, I'll shame the CEOs for uh, moving, closing their factories and moving it overseas. That has not happened at a presidential level. You do have senators and governors, you know, who will who will speak out. But we're in an overall framework about globalization and trade, in which no Democratic leader, no Republican leader has done what Trump has done on saying I'm gonna battle for American companies. And I prioritize, I don't care if there's a formula for an economic formula for how we're all better off uh, having this larger trading relationship. Um, and actually Trump you know, didn't deliver. You have a decline of manufacturing. Um, you, have a, you have a manufacturing depression, but he does get credit for being the only one who's been willing to challenge the conventional wisdom about how you promote American welfare and American jobs. 
Well, and that that feeds into another question that we got, and we'll come back to that other polling question that we have. But um, what about the, the the question is is asking what about the successful renegotiation of NAFTA, the USMCA? Is that likely to carry weight with Macomb voters? And um, does the credit does the president get credit for that? No, no. The um, you know I look I during this whole period I was going back to Macomb. You know, while at the beginning when it was being negotiated, but at the beginning it was it was the trade war with China that was most visible to people, um, and the tariffs. Um, and I actually found people conflicted. You know, I was very surprised. The, the look, the men understand it. If you go to a Macomb County focus group and talk about what's happening on the economy, they go right to NAFTA. They understand, you know, how they, you know, what it's cost them. But when you go to the women, it's more complicated because they are, they're, they think the supply chain, this, this thing has developed, gone further down the line. They're looking at consumer goods and, and, and whether you can turn it back. You know, when I go to Wisconsin, when I'm not dealing directly in the auto industry, when I'm dealing with manufacturers, you know, and, and suppliers, you know, I, you know, I see truck drivers who say, who are driving for Amazon, or, you know, driving, you know, off, you know, off of the, depots um, at Amazon and they say I'm not sure we're going back you know my jobs right now are in the distribution you know off of Amazon and it, you know it's not the country's pretty sophisticated and even and even on tariffs uh, you know you you had people believing um, that there was high cost they weren't sure they trusted him to, to do tariffs in the right way because required a kind of balance on how you do it um, they also weren't sure about what he was doing on, on the the subsidies or payoffs to agriculture, uh, which they thought was going to his friends or the big guys, you know, not the people who were struggling. And you have, and you have high levels of farm, you know, foreclosure taking place right bankruptcy taking place right now, and so it's pretty mixed reaction to him in the rural areas and reaction to on trade. You know, it the trade agreement was very late in the game. It had democratic support. And it made, they made changes that made it possible to vote for it for many of them. Uh, but it's, um, I don't see anybody bringing it up. And I, don't, and, I, and I don't even see Trump really talking about it. So back to the... Uh... It's, not, it's not like I remember, like I remember when he campaigned on TPP um, and said Hillary is only waiting until after the election to come back here and do uh, Obama's bidding on trade. And I'm going to I'm going to pull out of NAFTA. And those were clear positions. This was, was late in the process and with kind of mixed results. And, and since we're on that, and I do want to get back to the other polling question, but, but you, it keeps feeding into other questions that we've, that we've gotten. Um, in 2016, when Bernie Sanders campaigned in the primary here, the question is getting at, uh, he also talked about trade and NAFTA and TPP. Can you comment a little bit about uh, Bernie Sanders' appeals in Macomb County in, uh, four years ago? Well, four, you know, four years ago, and you know, and and you know, and now, but it, you know, but it was uh, obviously the it was very curtailed, and and, and campaigning, uh, you know, was difficult in in, uh, in in the process. But no, no, the fighting trade agreement was very strong with working people in Democratic primaries. Uh, particularly in the Rust Belt. But understand how divided Democrats are on trade. Because when you deal with Democratic leaders, they're not just dealing with, you know, the industrial Midwest. They're also dealing with the two coasts, which are much more pro-trade um, and, 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 and actually favored TPV. Um, and we're not for pulling out of, uh, or changing uh, NAFTA. Um, and so you have college educated voters who are you know, much more likely at this point to support Democrats. You know, they are more pro freight, free trade agreements. Um, Asian voters are more pro free trade. Mexican Americans are more pro free trade. And so for Sanders, it mattered a lot. And it was a very important issue in the primaries. And it, but it was even more important in, in the general. I mean, I can look at the, I have my own data, Hillary, lost because of it, because her inability to counter what Trump was saying, which was saying, I'm going to betray working people. 
you know, because she was quiet and silent because she didn't want to offend Obama, who was still trying to pass it. Um, so it was important for Sanders, but it was even more important for Trump um, in winning in 16. Back to the, the polling question we got a, a bit ago. Uh, the question is, do you follow the Trafalgar group polling and, their, and the success that they had in 2016? Do you think they will be successful in their 2020 predictions? Yeah, I, I actually, in fairness, I don't know it well enough to, um, why, don't you, why don't you have your questioner elaborate? Mm -hmm. We will ask her to do so in the chat and then maybe we'll come back to it. Okay. Um, but as that happens, uh, you, we've heard a lot here in Michigan uh, and you mentioned it briefly, the Obama Trump voters. Uh, are those Obama Trump voters still with Trump? No, no, mm -hmm. overwhelmingly no. And the I've seen the data, I've seen, you know, the polls that we've done, I've done focus groups, you know, the, um, no, the, he really has lost, you know, lost, you know, the, now there's people who didn't vote, it's not just, it's not just Obama, there are people who didn't vote on, on the president at all, or on that, you know, you know, in the, with Romney, there was a lot of things one could do in, you know, in 16, uh, but no, the data is very clear that they have, they have, they have pulled off of Trump. I mean, Trump really did lose them um, in, you know, in 2000, within a year. Um, they were very much wanted, ho hoped for him to address healthcare, as you've seen in our data. Um, and he didn't, he made it worse. And he said he would touch, you know, Medicare and Medicaid, and then he proposed major cuts to it. Uh, he, um, so on healthcare, he, and, and above all, the corporate tax cut was a corporate tax cut. And they viewed it for the rich. If, and if you look at what I was saying, you know, in this talk, at every point, the voters in Macomb are looking for political leaders who are willing to stand up to the companies, willing to stand up to the CEOs, and stand up for American jobs. They thought Trump would do that, but they don't. They stop believing that. We're going to come back to that to that pollster question because I've got a little bit more information on it. Um, in a minute, but uh, to pick up on something you had talked about in an earlier question response, uh, it, I'm gonna paraphrase this one. Um, both candidates have been to Macomb County in the last few weeks, the last month or so. Uh, they're clearly trying to earn votes of Macomb County citizens. Uh, Biden has talked about Buy American and Made in Michigan. Is that uh, an attempt to counter Trump's strength in the county? Um, I, in, a, in a bigger sense, not, I mean, not just in the county, but in a, in a bigger sense, because, you know, Biden was saying, I think for the first time coming out of the primary, that he was going to promote by America and actually had a huge program of investment um, to, 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 to source a whole range of things to, you know, build up American jobs um, and favor those companies. Um, you know, in his, is in his investments, but that's a you know that's a it's a big change of culture and mindset, and it's a big change of economics. Uh, it's pr produced, I think, you know, by Trump. Not so much of what Trump did because Trump didn't deliver on what he promised to do on America First. Uh, there is no evidence, you know, that he delivered you know delivered uh, an economy that was producing more in America but they wanted it. But they also didn't have leaders who actually said building in America is better. <laughs> that, that's what we believe in. American citizens get priority. You know, we, you know, we, want, we want to build our industries here. Uh, he, in some sense, he created permission for you know, Biden to develop that position with a real economic plan. But it's also a change in mindset. It's not okay for move, you know, to move jobs to Mexico simply because it's part of a North American trade agreement. We are gonna have policies that favor supply chains that start in America. Well, Trump only talked about it, he didn't really do it, but Biden has a, you know, has a really serious economic plan you know, that does that. It does really with, with sourcing on you know, major needs of the country, uh, but also you know, public sector, you know, buying America, uh, it's, a, it's a change that I believe Trump produced. I don't think it's so much tactical. 
as there's been a, you know, a, a real change in how political leaders are willing to talk about how you help America. Uh, let's shift gears for a second uh, and ask a question about, about foreign policy. Uh, how, one, how important is foreign policy this year? And two, does the, uh, do the peace agreements between uh, Israel and, and Arab countries that were, have been announced by the White House in the last month or so uh, important to voters right now? No. Does, uh, I, I, the, the, question, the uh, questioner also wants to know if um, Trump I, gets- I should to elaborate. Uh, you know, look, sometimes when people are um, you know, leaning into a vote, they're looking for a reason you know, to be for somebody. You know, you have an incumbent president with an, on, on average, 44% approval rating. It has not moved. It has stayed at 43, 42, 44 for four years. There's been some change in how many percent who disapprove, but the approve has not changed, has not moved. And, and, I, and I think if you look at the dynamic and I look at, for example, at the first debate, Commentators looked at the first debate and said, Trump made a fool of himself, you know, he alienated people, you know, Biden did so-so. I think that misreads what was happening. I think the, the voters who are not considering voting for Trump were looking to be reassured that he was strong, he could stand up, he could stand up to Trump in a fight, you know, that, you know, that he was, could go through 90 minutes, still be agile and, and sharp. And it was, it was a low bar, but it was, it, we had a five point shift in the vote, you know, coming out of nationally and, you know, in states after the debate. It was almost the first shift in a while. So people are kind of looking to get to their either Biden vote or their non-Trump vote. Um, and the debate was that, you know, if we were looking at a situation where people were looking for, how can I get myself the vote for, for Trump? I can see where people would, would go to this and say, look, he's, he's, he's bringing back the troops. He's made these peace agreements. Uh, you know, he's not a, got us into any new wars. But I don't see any, I don't see that group of voters out there. They're looking for a reason to be for Trump. And that's why I think the margin, you know, was 9.6% for Democrats in the midterms. It's 10.6 on average now. You know, it's like, there's been, there's been no change in the structure of this race where you know, a majority of the country are hostile to Trump and looking for the political outlet. It changes when you have the, the midterms and you vote in the House or governor in Michigan, and now you have you know, Biden as the option, but that structure just has not changed since uh, Trump has come in. And a, a question about uh, another polling question. Um, the questioner has uh, seen some polling recently that shows that there's some growing support, maybe marginally, but still growing support for President Trump uh, among minorities, including African Americans and, and Hispanics. Um, is that an important point? Uh, yes, uh, it is. Um, and it's real. The, um, but it was also true in 16. Yep, you know, there's a, look, there's, gonna, there's going to be a gender tsunami uh, in this election that cuts across every group. And there is, there is a, there's something about Trump's, you know, leadership style, you know, that pushes away women and, and gets some men that wouldn't otherwise, you know, vote for him. So Trump got 17% of African-American, you know, men uh, in 16. You know, we've had polls where it's 15 to 20% uh, with them. It's not new. Uh, same thing if you look at Hispanics, where, you know, Biden is extremely strong with the Hispanic women, and we have it split evenly uh, with the Hispanic, you know, men. And so every group you look at, you know, millennials, same, you know, it's not the same thing. White millennials are all now turned strongly, you know, against Trump. But it was not true earlier. Earlier, it was the white millennial women very strong for Biden and Democrats. And the men, you know, split. That's changed, but there again, each group you go to, there's a gender divide. Trump has, has 
create this enormous divide. So it started with the Women's March. You know, I think it started, you know, with the Access Hollywood tape and uh, an election where gender became very important. But his whole presidency has played out, uh, you know, across these gender lines. Um, that makes it hard for him to win because he's created such a big block against him in every group amongst the women. He's, he does better than you would expect with the men, but not, but not enough to, look, if you lose, you know, black men by 80-20, well, let's have big turnout. <laughs> I mean, yes, he's doing better. You know, nobody's ever gotten that 20%, but if you have a big turnout, that's, that's a huge gain for Democrats. And so it's, it's part of the culture of Trump and how this election is playing out. But it's, um, we'll have to figure that out at a later time, but it's, it's real. I, I, we are way over time and we wanna be respectful of everybody's time, in, in, including yours. So we'll, we'll end with a, a question really just about Macomb. Um, and what makes Macomb a bellwether? It seems uh, that as goes Macomb, so goes Michigan and so goes the nation a lot of times. What, what is it about Macomb that makes it that way? You know, I think you're absolutely right that it's, it's a bellwether. Uh, and it, it's a bellwether because, yeah, you know, it's a different, bellwether may not be the right word. Because bellwether kind of like, if you follow the, you know, who wins there, you know, they could be eking along, but there's, there's no big swings necessarily. Macomb, if you looked at, you know, the graph that I presented, has big swings. You know, that it, you know, it's, it's moved dramatically for the Democrats, dramatically for Reagan, you know, and Nixon, um, dramatically, you know, starting for Clinton, very seriously for Obama. Uh, and I believe it's because, you know, it's white working class voters, and by the way, a more diverse working population as well. Hmm. But they're very, it was very unionized, very conscious, I think, you know, of, you know, of, of their ability to, to demand change and, and a better life. They thought they represented the core, you know, values of, of the country, uh, but there was a political consciousness. And so that they were, you know, they were angrier when, uh, when, the, when they felt they were forgotten um, and they were really respectful and appreciative when someone listened to them as we saw what happened with, you know, Obama when he ran in, you know, 2000, you know, 2008 uh, and with Clinton uh, when he went, you know, he went to, to hear them. And so there's a political consciousness, there's a history uh, that swings back and forth, not a bellwether, that actually really does indicate where the country's going because it, it means you are, if you're winning them, it means you recognize that like 65% of the country don't have four-year college degrees and people are listening to us. Um, and that's a big message, uh, you know, for the country and they should keep listening to Macomb and you should still keep paying attention. Thank you, Dr. Greenberg. Uh, thanks to all the participants. Thanks so much to our sponsors, uh, Macomb County Chamber of Commerce, Oakland University in Macomb, Leadership Macomb and First State Bank. Uh, thanks, everybody, for a great discussion, great evening. Dr. Greenberg, the next time you are in Michigan, you are uh, welcome to come to Oakland University's campus. Uh, we'd love to have you. Same. Thanks for inviting. Can't wait to do it. Have a good night, everybody.